falling asleep, the Lord put on my heart really heavily that some people in here need to hear this message. So that's pretty rare. That does not happen a lot, but I'm guessing this message is probably going to be for some of you guys. And you guys know uh, we joke about how most sermons have like, you know, two stories and a joke or two jokes and a story. And so, you know, we disdain that very clearly because the Bible's full of stories. So if we need stories, we can just read the Bible. We don't need to add stories and jokes and all these kinds of things. But I am actually starting this morning's sermon with a joke because it is, it's a corny joke. And you guys have probably heard it before because I don't have a lot because I'm not a comedian. Imagine, I'm like, what? Yeah, I'm a pastor. I teach the Bible. But there's this joke. It's about a pastor teaching the Bible. It's really funny. So is a church and they hired a pastor uh, imagine being hired, hireling. It's okay. We're not going to go into that. So this pastor gets hired, right? And he goes in and he preaches a message. And the elders are like, all right, yeah, we did pretty good here. This guy seems to, seems to be a good sermon. And so he comes back next week and the pastor preaches the exact same sermon. And they're like, okay, that was kind of weird. It was a good message though. So all right. And then the third week, yes, he preaches that same message. So finally, the elder, one of the elders goes up to him and says, you preached the same message three weeks in a row, to which the pastor responds, I figured I would preach it till you guys actually did it. And so that's what Jesus is basically doing this morning, right? He healed the, uh, the 5,000 in Mark chapter 6. And now, this morning, he's going to, feed, feeding, rather, feeding the 5,000 there in Mark chapter 6, and now he's going to be feeding the 4,000 here in Mark chapter 8. So, as we do, we're going to, we'll do it a little bit different in terms of our reading. We'll read over verses 1 through 10, because they're kind of like a unit, and then when we get to the second part, verses 11 through 21, we'll read over that. So, let's start with verses 1 through 10. And we're going to cover them together, so let's go ahead and read over them. It says, In those days the multitude, being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the multitude, because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their own houses, they will faint on the way, for some of them have come from afar. Then his disciples answered him, how can one satisfy these people with bread here in the wilderness? He asked them, how many loaves do you have? I'm getting deja vu yet? And they said, seven. He commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and gave thanks and broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And they set them before the multitude. They also had a few small fish, and having blessed them, he said to set them also before them. So they ate and were filled, and they took up seven large baskets of the leftover fragments. Now those who had eaten were about 4,000, and he sent them away, immediately got into the boat with his disciples, and came to the region of Dalmanutha. So just a chapter and a half ago, back in Mark chapter 6, Jesus fed the 5,000. And now, ostensibly, just a very short time later, we have Jesus again here feeding 4,000. And the method by which Jesus does this is essentially identical. But the lesson for us is in what happens preceding the miracle, kind of the small talk between Jesus and his disciples. And that's where we find the lessons and so the first thing we notice that's different in this miracle versus the feeding of 5,000 is that here Jesus himself initiates the conversation with his disciples. And he does so in an extremely odd way. He says to them in verse 2, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. Church, that is a weird way to start a discussion with your disciples. Imagine, right? Jesus is sitting there, and we're all his disciples, and he looks over and he says, I have compassion on the people. We're like, 
right? It's kind of like, uh, did, did we say you didn't? <laughs> kind of weird, right? It's kind of like a, a response rather than a statement. So they're sitting there, and they're probably thinking, hmm, we're three days in. Do you think he remembers we're human and we need to eat? Remember, Jesus is someone who's been watching these guys sit there for three days, getting more and more hungry, right? And he's waiting to see if they learned the lesson from the last time they had this exact miracle in this exact situation. And Jesus is pretty patient, huh? I think of this as like a staring contest that only one person knows they're having. And so Jesus is just like looking over at them, and they're like, Jesus is acting kind of strange, guys. <laughs> yeah, Jesus is waiting to see if you're getting it. And this is our own lives too, right? Jesus does this often with us, and we're just like, why is Jesus looking at me? <laughs> Jesus is wondering how long you're going to keep hitting your head against the wall. And we usually will keep going for a very long time. So these guys, they've been sitting there for three days, getting more and more hungry. And now Jesus is just trying to see, like, are they going to learn the lesson from last time? Think how hard-headed the disciples are. They waited three days and still did not say anything to Jesus about everybody probably getting hungrier and hungrier. And the best part is they were probably even proud of themselves. They were probably like, we didn't say anything this time. We're doing good. Because remember, last time what they did is they came to Jesus and they're like, you need to send everybody away, right? And so this time they didn't do that. And so they're like, we, did, we, we passed the test. We didn't do it. We didn't say send everyone away. And he didn't feed them. It's getting awkward. I mean, I don't know. To me, this is probably one of the funniest miracles Jesus has done, just how far he lets it go. And another reason Jesus starts by saying, I have compassion on the multitude, is because you'll remember last time the disciples came to them, and they're basically like, we're in the middle of nowhere, and it is late. You need to send the people away so they can go eat. They're basically saying, last time, we have compassion on the people. So that's basically how they began the conversation last time. Jesus, we have compassion on the people. It's late, you know. We're far, we're in the middle of nowhere. We should just, they, they should just go. Church, should we ever be sending people away from Jesus? Right, so you get the imagery, right? So they're like, you know, we have compassion. Is compassion sending people away from Jesus or sending them to Jesus? Is Jesus able to ha handle all the problems in our life or just the Sunday morning kind of problems? Well, Jesus can heal everybody, but feeding them, whoa, whoa, man, walk it back a little. That's... You know, we hit our grocery stores for that. They're basically implying that Jesus didn't have compassion on the people. Who do you think is more compassionate, Jesus or his disciples? I'm going to go with Jesus. So Jesus says to them, I have compassion on the multitude because they've now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their own houses, they will faint on the way, for some of them have come from afar. He's basically there in the second part, you know, almost repeating what they said to him, but like switching it around on them a little bit, which has got to be pretty funny. I'm sure the disciples are like, uh, yeah, what's going on here? And so I think, you know, from... This account, we can all agree that Jesus definitely wasn't focused on a social gospel message, you know, where the emphasis is on helping people rather than preaching to the people. Otherwise, he wouldn't have waited three days to feed them, right? Our mission is to preach Jesus, not to feed people or give them, you know, job training or these kinds of things. Not because those things aren't important, but because that's not what our mission is. We don't get to decide what our mission is. The Bible's clear. We talk about it often. We're ambassadors for Christ. Our mission is to go tell people that Jesus loves them, that Jesus died for them and wants to save them, and that through faith in him they can have a relationship with him and be saved. That's our mission. That's our message. So we don't get to decide on that. That's not up to us. 
uh, an ambassador doesn't get to decide what his message is. He goes and preaches the message that the king tells him to preach. And our king has given us his message very clearly. So we don't need to guess what our mission is. Our mission is not to feed people or to try to do social good. That's not to say that we shouldn't. The Bible says to do good to all men, especially those of the household of faith. But our mission is to preach Christ and him crucified. And so we don't want to get confused. Here Jesus has gone three days. If we were to have a social gospel message, Jesus wouldn't have waited three days to feed the people. We see this also in Acts chapter 16, verse 9, where Paul has a dream from someone in Macedonia who says, come, help us. And so we always joke, you know, Paul goes and opens a food kitchen in Macedonia. No, he goes and preaches the gospel. That was his idea of help. Macedonia, if you know early church history, that was like the poorest church ever, except for the Jerusalem church, which dabbled in socialism. <laughs> Poor Jerusalem church. So the Macedonian church, they were very poor. And yet, what was the help that Paul gave them? He gave them the gospel. That's important. What are we going to give uh, the people that are most at need, most vulnerable in this society? Are we going to say, be warm and filled and give them stuff? Or are we going to give them Jesus and try to help them to the extent to which we can? Which is the more pressing need in God's mind? for us to have food in our tummies, or for us to be on our way to heaven. This life is a short test, then we stand in front of God. You know, if it's all real, what's written in the book, you better believe it's way more important that people know Jesus than if their stomachs are filled. And that offends a lot of people. Jesus said, you will have the poor with you always. When Jesus came to this world, he came as a poor person, a homeless person. So, we're not to, you know, be uh, indifferent to the plight of those who are, you know, in need or the least of these. We definitely want to try to help people, but our mission is to give them Jesus. So we don't want to get confused about that. We're his, we're his ambassadors. Our mission is to preach the word. We want to give them Jesus Christ. So Jesus preaches for three days, and you figure they've gone a full day now without food, and now they're on their second day without food, assuming that they ate before they left their houses that first morning to go hear Jesus speak. So they're probably getting pretty hungry right about now. So in a practical sense, this has effectively filtered out all the people who came there to try to get free food. Because the miracle, the people have heard about it, that Jesus had fed all these people, so now I'm sure even more people are following him. It describes a very great multitude. But you imagine, you imagine a lot of them would have left as they start to get more and more hungry, and they're like, all right, he's not going to do it again. So all the people that were seeking the bread, they're gone now. And I know that might sound far-fetched, but don't forget John 6, 26, where Jesus says, hey, you guys didn't, he effectively says, hey, you guys didn't follow me because you have heard about the signs that I'm fulfilling, you know, the prophecies I'm fulfilling. You guys followed me because you ate bread and were full. And that's an important thing to understand. Being full, that was not something, well, throughout all of history in most geographical locations, eating till you're full has been a luxury that most people have never been able to enjoy. You know, nowadays we throw food in landfills and, you know, it, it's a different ball game. But throughout all of history, eating till you're full, man, what, it was, you had a fruit tree that was harvesting and you had to eat it quicker. You know, like, that was not a common thing to be able to eat until you were full. And so Jesus, he made enough food that these people could eat until they were full. You better believe they were telling everyone, like, man, this guy, he made food out of nothing, and we all ate till we were full. They're like, what? Yeah, it was amazing. So this, you can see why people would follow Jesus around for this. But waiting three days, you can see how that would filter out the people who had the wrong motivations, so to speak. So after three days, you know, they've kind of shaken off those who weren't interested in seeking God and were just instead looking for a handout. But we see from this passage that Jesus knows our needs. He knows our frailties, our weaknesses. He's compassionate. He doesn't send the people away half-starved. And remember, Jesus is God. He, in his uh, deity, he knows all things. So he says they will faint. <laughs> he's, he's not joking. He's like, okay, some of these guys are pretty, pretty close. We, we better feed them. I have compassion on the people. 
And in terms of application, if, we, if we're picking up what Jesus is putting down here in terms of a lesson, it's that we need to trust him to provide. And part of trusting him to provide is going to be asking him at times. That seems very obvious, but you'd be surprised how often people do not want to ask God things. I don't want to beat up the guys, but it's usually guys. Girls are a little better at this. Guys, we're, you know, pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. We don't like to ask help. The new generation of guys is like, are you kidding? I love help. Help me everything. And you're like, I'm kidding, young guys, kind of. So I don't think it would all be grasping to assume that Jesus is saying, I have compassion on the people I don't think it would be grasping to say that he's still doing that and not doing it because they haven't asked. Jesus wants us to ask, right? He says, you receive not because you ask not. So I don't think it's grasping to say that Jesus is not doing it here because he's kind of having that staring contest with his disciples like, are you guys going to ask? We have to ask for things in life. The Bible's clear about that. God has good gifts that he wants to give us. Any parent understands this. I, I joke that I have four kids. I will let them eat until they burst almost but I'm not going to just like keep shoving. F- this is not like, I'm not like a buffet over here. Like if you ask, I will give you more food. I'm not just going to keep bringing it out like a little king or something. Like, yes, yes, some more grapes. Shall I fan you while you eat? The-? You know, no, they have to ask, right? Any parent gets this. There's more food, but you got to ask. God's the same way sometimes in life. He wants us to ask. And that's an important thing. How many of you guys have had kids and the kids are like, Well, God knows what I need, so why do I have to pray? How many parents have ever heard that question? I remember my kids have asked me things like that. Yeah, you know why? Because as humans, we already tend to be entitled, right? We already think God owes us everything. God doesn't owe us everything. So it's not just that. It's also the fact that in a relationship, you have to have communication, Communication is one of the central pillars of any healthy relationship. So if we don't ask for things, then the relationship is not going to be working out well. That's a question that most pastors have heard. If God knows what I need, why do I have to pray? Well, because we're already entitled, and he wants to have communication with us. So between those two things, I think there's plenty of reasons as to why we need to be asking God for things. And there's just the good old one that he told you to, and he's God and you're not, so you should probably pray. So that's something that we need to remember. God knows what we need, but he wants us to ask because healthy relationships are founded upon communication, not entitlement. That's a recipe for a disastrous marriage, friendship, whatever. You ever had a friend where you guys are really close and everything and you give them gifts and you, you guys, you know, in, in, a, in a friendship there's, you know, give and take, right? But the other person's never thankful and they're just like, oh yeah, cool. That's not very, you have to be a very patient person to have a friend like that, let's say. And God is very patient, but he doesn't want us to be jerks to everyone else in our lives, As Christians, we should always be thankful. We should not be the person that does not say thank you. You know, man already has a proclivity to expect things. Children in particular need to be trained to combat this sense of entitlement that's so destructive and yet so prevalent in our culture and even in Christianity. God doesn't owe us anything. And yet, he's gone to extraordinary lengths at indescribable cost to himself to save us. And so we can at least have the, the, the decency, I hate that word now, it's been so politicized, the decency to ask God and thank God and not just be entitled and think God owes us everything. God expects an open line of communication. He expects us to respond in faith rather than like, oh no, you know, what am I going to do again? He wants us to trust in him and to ask. And yet how often we go through problems in life And God comes through for us because finally, when we're near death, we're like, all right, Lord, can you help me? My last resort. And then God helps us. 
And then we go through the same thing like six months later and do the same thing, just like the disciples do here, right? This had just happened to them. They were just in a situation where they had a bunch of people that they couldn't help in their own resources. Jesus came in and saved the day. Now here, they're in a situation where there's a bunch of people that they can't help with their own resources. And this time, Jesus lets them sit. And he's like, okay, how long, how long are we going to play this game? They still don't. And Jesus is fine, like, okay, I have compassion here. You guys may not. Is that how we are in our relationship with God? Does God finally step in and save our butts for the sake of our families or whatever? Or do we humble ourselves before the Lord, acknowledge that we need him, and finally ask him, acknowledging that, hey, you can't do this on your own. How many of you guys are going through things in this life that you've been through before, you've played the level before, but you're still too hard-headed to reach out to him and ask him and be like, Lord, I did it again. I need your help again. Humble yourself before the Lord. The Lord loves you. He wants to help you. And he probably will still step in and save your butt and be like, okay, fine, I have compassion. Even if you're too hard-headed, I will help you again, like we see here. But he wants us to learn that lesson. He's compassionate. He knows that we're but flesh. He knows that we fall short. He knows that we screw up and make mistakes and make messes of our lives. But luckily, he's in the business of fixing the messes that we make in our lives. But he does want us to ask. And that's what we see going on here this morning in this passage. They refuse to ask. Things don't go as planned for the disciples. And so for whatever reason, rather than asking Jesus to fix the situation, they do nothing. And worse yet, you know, they doubt. Look at verse 4. It says, how can we satisfy all these people with bread in the wilderness? Can you imagine being Jesus and hearing that and trying to keep a straight face? Imagine. Jesus is like, where were you guys like a couple weeks back when this happened last time? Where are we going to get bread? Like, can you imagine? Guys, this is real. Imagine hearing this. You would be pulling your hair out. They just saw Jesus do this same miracle. And yet in our own lives, we do the same thing. I, I don't know how I'm going to pay rent. I, what am I going to do this month? I don't know. I'm going to die. And God's like, what happened last month? And the month before, and the month before, and the month before, and the month before. Like, right? He makes it work. I'm sick again. Ah, oh, my boss is giving me trouble again. Ah, oh, I'm having an argument with my insert whatever here, kid, spouse, whatever, neighbor, whatever. What did God do last time? Well, he made it work, but this time's different. This time's my fault. Yeah, last time was too. But we all do it, right? What am I going to do? What's God going to do? I don't know. Maybe it won't work this time. Ah. Guys, God wants the training wheels to come off in your life. That's why he lets you keep going through this stuff again and again. That's why he keeps letting you make the same mistake over and over again. Because he loves you. He wants you to have faith in him. You're going to be with him forever. How well do you want to know him? If you're going to be with him forever, don't you want to know him well before you get there? Or do you want it to be like an awkward blind date? You're like, hi, hi. I, I meant to read that text. Yeah, I, I, yeah. You want to be close to Jesus. And let's be honest. If you're not, you probably aren't going to be getting there because it's about a relationship. And when he rejects the people who want to go be with him, because trust me, everyone does, reality of the situation. He says, depart from me, I never knew you. It's about a relationship. And that relationship is built upon trust. Would you want to be married to someone who would never ask you for anything? That sounds nice on its surface until you recognize that the attitude that most of us have towards someone we don't like is, I'm not asking them for anything. Right? Is that how we want to be with God? 
No, we need God. We need to be asking him humbly, not like half of Christianity, like, I command in the name of Jesus, give me the Ferrari. No, no, not that either. The Bible talks about how when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith upon the earth? Because half of Christianity is like, no, I'm not going to ask God. The other half is like, I'm going to tell God what's up. He's giving me this right now. And neither are what he has in mind. He wants us to humble ourselves before him and to seek his face. Not his goodies, his face. A relationship. Not an ATM. But he wants us to be close enough to him that like a child speaking to his father, he can say, we can say to him, Daddy, can you help me with this? I screwed up again. How many of you guys remember if you had fathers who were decent when you were young and you had a problem with something and bringing it to your dad and saying, Dad, I screwed up. Can you help me with this? And your dad hopefully was like, of course, here, come sit on my lap. I'll show you how we fix it. That's what God desires. That's the relationship he wants with you, where you can cry out to him, Abba, Father. And he can fix those problems in your life. And if you want to do ministry, and we are all called to do ministry in some ways, then you better have that resource to draw from because if you're trying to do ministry in your own power, then you will fall flat on your face. And we're going to talk about that more here in a minute because that's at the heart of the lesson for today's text. He wants it to be settled in the minds of the disciples that they can trust in him. And very clearly, they're not getting it yet. So Jesus has to do that same miracle again with the same lesson again, showing them like, hey guys, what are you doing? Are you still trying to do it in your own strength? Are you still refusing to ask? And then you have this awesome little uh, interlude here in verses 11 and 12. Take a look at verses 11 and 12. Then the Pharisees came out and began to dispute with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven, testing him. But he sighed deeply in his spirit and transformed them into donkeys. No, sorry, that's what we would have all done. And said, why does this generation seek a sign? Assuredly, I say to you, no sign shall be given to this generation. So in verse 11, we have the religious leaders again, and they're like, hey, play by our rules, seek our approval. And Jesus responds in verse 12, like, not going to happen. And then Jesus and his disciples basically get out of there. And the irony, of course, is that Jesus has basically just done the craziest miracle you can imagine, right? He just fed, you know, 4,000 people, not counting the women and children, with a little boy's sack lunch. And then the religious leaders come up and say, hey, do a miracle for us. And then we'll give you the approval. We'll tell people from the temple, you know, yeah, this might be the Messiah. If you play, our, play by our rules, seek our approval. You, 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 your, your hall pass, it hasn't been stamped by the teacher. Jesus is like, I'm the principal. Think how funny this is. Do a miracle for us. You, you, you jump through a little flaming hoop. Here, do a hula hoop while juggling. Jesus is like, who are, you, who are you guys? Why are you here? And they were there to point to the Messiah, huh? That was their whole job. Tragic. Basically just did the craziest miracle imaginable. Anyone who's done apologetics, which is simply just defending the faith or you know, discussing with people the historicity or evidence for the Christian faith and these kinds of things, Anyone who's done apologetics fairly often has experienced this kind of mentality. And it's not that people who are rejecting Christ, it's not that they just don't have the evidence because there's mountains of evidence. It's, it's not that. It's more, it's not that, you know, they don't, they don't get it. It's that they don't want to get it. They don't want to hear it. They refuse to see the evidence that clearly and easily and overwhelmingly shows the historicity of the Bible and the Gospels and you know, Christianity as a whole. There's tons of evidence. And if you've ever been doing apologetics, defending the faith, and you've shown evidence to people, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, they'll close their eyes and say, I don't see it, what are you talking about? We were discussing on 
Friday night with one of the teens, and we were discussing basically this kind of exact topic. And they made a theoretical question and said, well, aside from the evidence, how do we know the Bible's true? I said, wow. Basically, like, imagine the mental gymnastics. Like, if we ignore the evidence... How do we know the Bible's true? Like, I, we, that's why you don't, because you've been ignoring the evidence. Yeah. If someone doesn't want to believe, there is no amount of evidence that will convince someone. It's not that people don't want to see, it's that they refuse to see. John 3.19 tells us why we don't have to guess. It's because their deeds are evil. If Jesus is real, then that means I'm living in sin and I'm on my way to hell and I need a savior and I better take this Christianity stuff seriously. And I don't want to do that, so I don't see anything that you're saying. Oh, uh, encryption of the Bible? That's nice. Archaeological evidence? Oh, that's cute too, yeah. Mathematical time date specific prophecies? Oh, isn't that special? You know, nobody cares. They don't care. I talked to them. Have you looked into it? Nope. I told you I'd buy the book. Yeah. There's movies on YouTube. Hmm. And then you stand in front of God, and God's like, wow, you were really successful at that. And they're like, yeah. And they're like, okay, so now you're separated from me. And they're like, wait, what? It's like the battle that if you win, you lose. Like a little kid, right? Eat your vegetables. Nope. Like, okay, your teeth are falling out. You have scurvy. You have never eaten a vegetable. <laughs> you win, you lose. I try to remind kids of that. Be like, okay, I know you're trying really hard to win right now. If you win, you lose. I'm trying to help you. Like, I'm not getting on the fire truck's ladder because it is purple and I do not like the color purple. I will get on a rainbow colored ladder. We do not have rainbow ladders. The building is on fire. I don't see the fire. You're on fire yourself. <laughs> it's, what do you do? You can't force people. You can love them into heaven. You can't argue them into heaven. In all the love in the world, at the end of the day, they can still reject if they so choose. People can go to hell, but Jesus literally says to them, literally, over my dead body. And so many people are like, my pleasure. It's tragic. The religious leaders, it's not that they didn't know who Jesus was. And you might be thinking, are you sure? Yes, the Bible's very clear about this. Jesus gives us the parable of the wicked vineyard workers, number one, right, where they say, this is the son, the heir, let's kill him and seize his inheritance. What was their motivation? They did not want to lose religious power. That's point number one. Point number two is John chapter three. When Nicodemus comes by night to Jesus, he says, we know that nobody could do the things that you're doing unless they came from God. Did they know that Jesus came from God? You better believe it. They were just upset that he didn't go to Jerusalem and say, all right, guys, tell everyone I'm here. You guys can be my agents. We can line everybody up for autographs. You know, you guys can schedule me out, and what, what do you guys think I should do? That's what they wanted. John the Baptist got it right. John 3.30, he must increase, but I must decrease. They did not want to decrease when the Messiah came on the scene. They wanted to increase. Do you want to be the star or do you want Jesus to be the star? Do you want to be the hero or do you want Jesus to be the hero? There can only ever always be one name in lights and it cannot be yours. It's got to be Jesus' name. And they couldn't handle that. So Jesus does this incredible miracle again. And the crowds make their way home. And the Pharisees come and question Jesus. And Jesus rebukes them in verse 12. And then the narrative picks back up in verse 13. Take a look at verses 13 and following. It says, And he left them, and getting into the boat again, departed to the other side. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread, and they did not have more than one loaf with them on the boat. Then he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. 
And they reasoned among themselves, always getting themselves in trouble when they do that, saying, it is because we have no bread. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Is your heart still hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? How many baskets full of fragments did you take up? They said to him, 12. Also, when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of fragments did you take up? They said, seven. So he said to them, how is it you do not understand? Gets a little technical and in terms of application, it's not like the most important detail. And you can't even really prove it. But after Jesus fed the 5,000, it sounds like they had basically brought, they were trying to bring those baskets to their families and everything like that. And that's when they got on that, in that storm that Jesus walked on the sea to rescue them. And so I don't think Jesus rebuked them for it. I'm, I would guarantee it. But this time they didn't bring any of the baskets. I think they, they thought that that was the problem. They're always trying to find the problem. They're like, is this the problem? Here they're doing it. Them, was this the problem? We didn't bring any bread this time. Like they're, they're like us. So we can't really get mad at them, right? We're dumb as it gets. <laughs> is this the problem, Lord? You're like, Lord, Lord. You're, you're holding like a, a beer and a joint. And you're like, Lord, are you upset with the song that just came on the radio? Here, I'll churn it. God, God's like, no, no, that other, yeah. Think back to Mark chapter 6, guys. How did all this begin? How did all this begin where Jesus first fed the masses? This first time that Jesus did this miracle. Why did Jesus do this miracle the first time? Do you remember? He sent out the disciples, and they came back. And they said, Lord, look at what we did. Lord, look at what we did. We're amazing. Yeah. We cast out these demons. It was ama We're amazing. We did it, Lord. You picked well. We got it figured out. What is feeding the masses symbolic of? What do we feed the people? God's word. Jesus says to John when he restores him in John chapter 20, if you love me, feed my sheep. Okay, so here, what's this symbolic of? The disciples ministering to a lot of people. Are they going to be ministering to a lot of people soon? In the book of Acts? Thousands? Whose strength do they need to be doing that in? Whose strength are they doing it in now? You guys getting it now? What's going on here? They're still trying to do it in their own strength. Lord, how are we going to feed these people? <laughs> Jesus is like, I, no, 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 not yet. All right, we're going to do this again. One more time. We can do it, Jesus. Look what we did. We did these incredible miracles. It's amazing. And then Jesus is like, you did nothing. Oh, you did? Okay, here, feed these people. We can't do that, Lord. Here, Jesus again, feed these people. Lord, still can't do it. He's like, oh, <laughs> did you last time? How did this work out last time? It's so frustrating, right? It's like, but that's us. <laughs> yeah, it's really depressing. Because that's the reality, right? We're going to continue to screw up. I still screw up. I'm not perfect. We're all going to continue to screw up. But we do need to be able to acknowledge after, be like, okay, I did it again, didn't I, Lord? He's like, yeah, you did it again. He loves us. He's patient. We're going to keep being stupid. Hopefully we get less stupid. People do teach sinless perfectionism because they don't understand the Greek verb tenses when they read passages like in 1 John and stuff and in James and there's passages there that can trip them up if they don't know the Greek where it's like he who is walking, if you love the Lord, you're not going to sin basically. But it's the present active verb tense. It's saying you're not going to continue ongoing living in sin. So we joke that we'll never be sinless, but we should be sinning less as we grow closer to Jesus. We, get, we, we become perfect when we get glorified, when we cast off this mortal coil. Paul had been a Christian for 25 years when he wrote the words, the things that I don't want to do that I do, and the things that I want to do that I do not do. And then he says, who will deliver me from this body of death? What's the answer to that question? 
When? When we die, right, glorification. We've talked about the tenses of salvation before. These are not very exciting things, but they're very important things, the tenses of salvation. We've talked about them on numerous occasions, how we're uh, first justified, then sanctified, then glorified. And we won't get into all that again, but we've talked about it on numerous occasions. And we do look forward to the day when we will be glorified, but God does not expect us to be perfect, but he expects us to learn from our mistakes, right? And to eventually start trusting in him and asking him for the strength to do what he's telling us to do. And that's at the core of this morning's message. God is calling all of you guys in this room to do stuff in your lives. And if you're trying to do it in your own strength, then like the disciples, you're going to fall flat. But if you trust in him and use his strength, which is available to you, you can do the things he's calling you to do, whatever they are. He does not tell you to do something he will not enable you to do. When he says, go over to the other side after he fed the 5,000 the first time, they should have trusted that they would be able to because he told them to do it. Instead, they freaked out and toiled at the, the oars all night long until at 4 or 5 in the morning, Jesus has to finally walk out there when all they had to do was cry out to him. Same lesson from before. Feed, cry out to him. Storm, cry out to him. Feed the people again. Cry out to him. Oops, we forgot the bread again. What do you think they should do here? Ask Jesus. But instead they're like, I think we're in trouble. We forgot the bread. And that's you. That's me. But we can learn the lessons. We don't have to keep playing the level again and again. We can trust in the Lord. And that's at the core of what's going on here. The people need to be fed God's word, and they need to be fed in his power. We can't do it in our own strength. It's got to be done in his strength, not our strength. The leaven of the Pharisees, guys, is pride. It's thinking, I can do this in my own power. I can do this in a way that points to me. What about me? I should be part of this. That was what the Pharisees were like, right? I should be looked to for wisdom and godliness. You know, look how wise and spiritual I am. That was that heart of the Pharisees. Did they trust in Jesus? Did they minister in the way that God wanted them to? No, but they were active in full-time ministry. Look around. This is epidemic in the church today. That's why Jesus in Matthew 7 says there's going to be a lot of professional Christians who aren't even going to heaven. Whose strength are we ministering in? Did I stay up all night long and pour over 50 different commentaries to give you guys the absolutely most incredible sermon ever that would point, touch on everything? And, or did I give the people what the Lord wanted me to give them through the power of his Holy Spirit? Did I listen to a bunch of great sermons on the radio that got received really well? I know because those churches have thousands of people in them, so I'm going to preach that to my church. Or did I just spend time with him and give what he wanted them to eat? In your own life, Am I going to, you know, send them this message that, you know, this message is amazing? Or am I going to pray and be like, Lord, what do you want me to say to this person? He just wants you to trust in him for what he wants you to do for him. That's the lesson. And the disciples, they're not getting it yet. They will. Once they're filled with the Holy Spirit, they start to get it. Same holds true for us. As we draw near to the Lord, we'll start to get it. Leaven, it's symbolic of sin, usually the sin of pride. It puffs up. Jesus, look at the incredible miracles we did. Okay, feed these people. They didn't get it. They didn't see that it was his power we must draw from, that it's got to be him working through us. Is he mad because we have no bread? Church, is Jesus concerned with our ability, with our giftedness? Are you impressed at the present you gave your child for Christmas? Do you look at your child as a more amazing, well, you're an amazing kid, you know that? Those roller skates, man, I underestimated you. Is he con concerned with our ability or our yieldedness? 
Is Jesus not able to provide? Is Jesus not enough? It's the Holy Spirit. We just sang it this morning. He's more than enough. That was the last song in worship. I did not plan that. It's the Lord. It's true. We can depend on him in life, in ministry, in marriage, in singleness, in sickness, in trials, all of it. And if we don't, we're going to play the level again. And he has no desire for that. He loves you guys. He wants you to grow. He wants you to trust in him. He wants you to run to him, to ask him. He wants to help you. He loves you. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we love you, and we're so thankful that you are patient with us, Lord. We are so hard-headed, Lord. We are slow to understand, Lord. We make these same mistakes again and again and again. And, Lord, you are patiently there waiting for us, and we thank you for that, Lord. But, Lord, we do pray that we would learn these lessons, Lord, that we would not strive to do the work of ministry, the, the walk, the Christian life in the power of the flesh. Lord, we, we need to ask you. We need to come to you. We need to trust in you. So, Lord, we pray and we ask right now corporately as a church family, Lord, would you fill us with your Holy Spirit to be able to do this work that you call us to do? Lord, to live out this Christian life to walk closely with you here in these last days when the temptation is over the top, when the distractions are over the top, Lord, when the discouragement is over the top. Lord, would you carry us through this so that we can be pleasing to you and so that we can feed these people what you fed us, that's saved us, that's filled us, the good news that you love us, Lord Jesus. So, Lord, help us to share that good news that you love us, that you want to save us from our sins. Lord, help us to to share that good news with these people that you bring into our lives. Lord, give us grace. Give us patience because, Lord, we need it. We are your dumb little sheep. And yet, Lord, you are the good shepherd. Help us to walk closely with you and to trust in you and to ask you when we need help. Thank you for your goodness, Lord. We love you, we praise you, we worship you, and we pray that you'd bless the time of fellowship we're going to have now. In Jesus' name, amen.